Well, we're going to continue today with our introduction. I kind of think, think of it more as a preparation for the book of Romans. Now, the last time we talked, it was, it was about Paul. And that in order to understand what he means by what he says, we necessarily have to understand his Jewish rabbinical mindset. This understanding of Paul as fully Jewish in every way, before, during, and after his acceptance of Yeshua as the long-awaited Jewish Messiah, that is the key to unlocking Paul's difficult words and his theology in all of his epistles. None more so than in Romans. The bad news is, is that since early in the second century AD, Paul has been characterized, typically, as having become more Gentile than Jew. And that the underlying premise of his theology is that Jewishness ought to be abandoned for those who wanted to join Christianity. The good news is that a different worldview of Paul has recently emerged from some, some highly respected top of the food chain Bible academics. This new worldview goes by the informal title of the new perspective. Now this new perspective goes against the basic understanding of Paul as a conflicted Jew or as a Jew who converted. It's a word we need to take out of our vocabularies, by the way. Converted and became a Gentile Christian, even if he maintained an outward appearance as a Jew, so that he could continue to live and walk among the Jewish community. Rather, this new perspective acknowledges his full-fledged Jewishness. A Jewishness he never abandoned and he never compromised it. Now, my stance is that the new perspective on Paul is a welcome breath of fresh air. It's on the right track. It has the potential to revolutionize the Christian faith. Because this new perspective offers what is a radical departure from 19 centuries of Christian thought and characterizations of Paul, those who champion it, beginning with E.P. Sanders, are only willing, however, to make some guarded philosophical statements about, about it. And they only want to delve lightly into a few technical Hebrew terms, a little bit of Jewish history, to follow up on the possible impact of this new perspective. They don't seem willing to challenge traditional Gentile Christian thinking with what is obviously Jewish cultural terms and expressions that Paul uses often, which do not match with what is typically taught by the church as its meaning. Now, I have little doubt that the reason for this reluctance to follow this road this new perspective road to where it will logically lead is because Sanders and others see it as possibly too disruptive to the accepted doctrines and, and, and theology of the institutional church. Therefore, it's a danger to their personal careers. But we shall pursue this line of thinking to its fullest. Because while it's new and it's troubling to some of our many church denominations... It is a fundamental to the Hebraic roots of Christianity and thus to the teaching and beliefs of Seed of Abraham Torah class. Now, I'm not going to take the time to review what we discussed in the first part of our introduction to Romans, Romans Lesson 1. If you missed it, I urge you to go back to the first lesson of, uh, on Romans on your own or you will not have some much-needed context for what's coming. So let's get some basics out of the way before we open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. There is little opposition among Bible scholars to the fact that it was Paul who wrote the book of Romans. 
He claims that he did. And what he discusses and how he discusses matters is typical Paul. In fact, in chapter 16, he says that he's writing this letter to the Romans from Gaius' house, a place where the local believers' congregation meets. If this is the same Gaius that he baptized and that we read about in 1 Corinthians 1, and it's likely that it is, then it means that Paul is writing his letter to the Romans from the city of Corinth. He's penning his letter in the city of Corinth to send to the Romans. His itinerary and his timeline, as it appears in the book of Acts, allows for this kind of interpretation. Paul had the stated intention of wanting to travel to Spain. Rome, then, would be a logical place to stop and to stay for a while on his way to Spain. Look at this map, you can see. Very likely, this letter was written towards the end of his third missionary journey, as it's known, when he was planning on getting back to Jerusalem in time for the Shavuot, the Pentecost festival. So with good confidence, we can say that the book of Romans was written in either 57 or 58 AD, probably leaning towards the earlier date. Now, what, we, what is important to know is that he wrote the letter to the Romans a few years before he was actually taken as a prisoner to Rome, where apparently he met his death. So don't mistakenly think that the book of Romans is the result of his time in Rome that we read about in the final chapter of Acts the order of our New Testament sort of creates that false impression because the book of Romans immediately follows the book of Acts and the New Testament. So it seems like it ought to be in a chronology one after the other. It is not. Acts, you see, is where we hear about his journey to Rome. Now, what this means, let's put this in perspective. What this means is that Yeshua had come and gone about 25 years, a quarter of a century earlier. And so the Jesus movement had been around a quarter century or so to spread. Turns out it was wildly successful. So what did Paul hope to accomplish by writing his extensive letter to the believing community in Rome? a letter that for its day was abnormally long. That is the subject of widely varying opinions. If one is from the rather standard evangelical worldview, then Paul's purpose was to use this letter to create a brand new Christian systematic theology. Just about every seminary around will tell you that. Fortunately, Mainstream Bible scholars who see validity in this new perspective on Paul are having the courage to at least start to pour a little cold water on this long-held Christian doctrine that Romans is essentially systematic theology. In his highly acclaimed commentary on Romans, Douglas J. Moo, a teacher at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, says this, it is not a systematic theology. It's a letter written in, a spe written in specific circumstances with specific purposes. The message of Romans is indeed timeless. But to understand its message aright, we must appreciate the specific context out of which Romans was written. That context is what we are going to develop now over the next several months as we study the book. It's too complex to reduce to a couple of stock bumper sticker phrases. However, the message of Romans therefore explains the purpose of Romans. And when it comes to the message, the viewpoints are also wide-ranging. But first and foremost... In modern Christianity, it is, as I've just said, Paul establishing a Christian 
uh, systematic theology primarily for the benefit of Gentiles. Now, as much as I disagree with that, I must also admit I have no rigid view on a single, ultimate, definable purpose or message for this book, the book of Romans. I think Paul has several issues in mind that he was addressing and in Romans directly aimed at the Roman believers, issues they were dealing with. However, by now, Paul had gained much experience in dealing with Gentiles and bringing Gentile believers into the fold. But because his preferred base of operations was, it didn't matter where he went to evangelize, it was a synagogue is where he liked to operate out of. This meant he also dealt with Jews. He dealt with bringing in Jewish believers into the fold. As Paul had learned the hard way, this dynamic of including Gentiles into a Jewish messianic faith, man, this opened up a religious can of worms regarding the, this very touchy re relationship issue between Jewish and Gentile believers. A touchy relationship issue, frankly, has, has barely changed over the two millennia since the days of Paul. So as my friend Joseph Shulam ap aptly puts it, the book of Romans presents us with a textual picture of certain prevalent and controversial theological debates within Second Temple Jewish thought. So if we approach the book of Romans understanding this underlying circumstance, then we're going to be far more able to decipher what Paul intends and what he's dealing with. Now, because I know that many of you may not have studied the book of Acts with me as a sort of prerequisite for studying the book of Romans, then a term such as Second Temple Jewish thought might sound a little bit highbrow or maybe confusing. This term is simply referring to that biblical time period when after the Babylonian exile of the Jews, the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt. The first temple was built by Solomon in the late 900s B.C., and it stood until the Babylonians destroyed it about 587 B.C. The second temple, then, is what Ezra and Nehemiah built as former Jewish captives, now set free by the Persians, some 70 years after the Babylonians had conquered them and raised the temple. So the second temple period actually begins as early as about 500 B.C., and it continues on and on until the Romans destroyed that second temple in 70 A.D. That said, what concerns us is that that small portion, just that small portion of this long Second Temple period that begins a little bit before the birth of Christ and then it continues throughout the New Testament time. Now, as you can imagine, is the case with almost any culture, many changes occur within, occurred within Jewish society and religion over the nearly 600-year time period from Israel's release from their captivity in Babylon to when the Second Temple was destroyed. What matters in our study is how Judaism was taught, it was known, and it was practiced by Jewish society from about the year 10 B.C. to about 70 A.D. And this is because, and here's the, the key, Judaism was the basis of Jewish society. I can't stress that strongly enough. Judaism was the basis of Jewish society. That was especially so in the Holy Land. But it also extended to all the places in the foreign lands where 95%, roughly, of all living Jews resided. Judaism was less stringent. It wasn't quite as dominant in the diaspora, 
But nonetheless, Judaism still formed the foundation for Jewish culture, even in the diaspora. That is because, unlike with modern Christianity, which is routinely compartmentalized and separated away from the non-religious parts of our lives, Judaism defined every detail of every aspect of Jewish life. 24 hours a day, every day of the year, from birth to death. If you were a Jew, in New Testament times, there was no compartmentalizing. There were no days off from your Judaism. You with me? Paul was a Jew. Others verified he was a Jew. People such as Luke and Peter. And he was a rabbi, having graduated from Gamaliel's rabbinical school. In fact, he belonged to one of the strictest sets, sects of Judaism called the Pharisees. This is something he readily admitted to. And he stated it for the record in Acts chapter 26 that he remained a Pharisee. This statement that he was still a Pharisee was made some years after he wrote the book of Romans. In fact, in Acts chapter 24, as he stood before Governor Felix, he plainly said that he also remained committed to the law. Of course, that's something that was mandatory if one was going to maintain their Jewishness. So, from the 30,000 foot view, I see the book of Romans as Paul wrestling within himself. And by and between the Gentile believers versus the Jewish believers in Yeshua. Over the place of those Gentile believers within the community of believers. As well as their place in the kingdom of heaven. See, Paul is caught between two worlds that on the surface have little of any common ground. He was thoroughly a rabbinical Jew who lived, li who lived his entire life based upon Jewish law, halakha. But at the same time, the risen Yeshua had instructed Paul to be his emissary to take this gospel to the Gentile world in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Since Paul was the designated apostle to the Gentiles, then it seems that Christ left it up to him to figure out how to establish principles and rules that would adapt a Hebrew gospel to a Gentile culture and maybe vice versa. Now, no doubt, this forced Paul to carefully examine something that had become hazy within Judaism over the last few centuries, and, and, and it intertwined within his life. Pay attention to this. What part of Judaism was actually Holy Scripture, and what part of Judaism was simply tradition? Where's the boundaries? Which rules are the non-negotiables? What should be seen as the core issues? What can be seen as side issues? What is mandatory? What's optional? Can there be different rules, even different theologies, for Jews versus for Gentiles if the two groups that have been historic enemies have any hope of living and worshiping side by side? as brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh yes, we know from the Bible, from other sources, that while Paul could legitimately claim his office as an apostle to the Gentiles, Yeshua himself had appointed Paul to the office as recorded in Acts chapter 9. There were other Jewish believers running around who took it upon themselves to proselytize Gentiles for Christ in Acts 18. 
we read of one particular independent Jewish evangelist named Apollos. In fact, the awkward position that Paul immediately finds himself in as he's penning the opening to his letter to the Romans is that he must admit he is not the founder of the believing community in Rome. He's never even been to Rome. Someone else, probably a few others, had some time ago established the believing community there. So, is Paul sheep-stealing by now jumping in and insisting that these believers of, of Rome follow his teachings and rulings? Paul's implication in the book of Romans is unmistakable. He holds himself up as the final authority over the congregation in Rome regardless of what those who first brought the gospel to Rome may have taught them. At the moment, James, brother of Jesus, was still the recognized leader of the way in Jerusalem, the acknowledged headquarters of the movement. Paul's answer is to, 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 to this question that he gives, and we find in the book of Romans, is the truth. Messiah, Yeshua, personally appointed him as the apostle. But will anybody believe him? That's a pretty, pretty major thing here we're talking about. Where's all the witnesses? Even more... Does being the apostle to the Gentiles elevate Paul's status such that all Gentile believers are to consider Paul as their leader instead of James? Might that thought split the Jesus movement into Gentiles and Jews, with Gentiles following Paul, Jews following James? See, this was the ambiguous, intense situation that Paul was facing. It's why he goes into such depth in his letter. He covers an array of issues. Some of his letter is to introduce himself. Some of it is to explain his office as an apostle and why the believers of Rome ought to submit to him. Some of it's to instruct Rome's believers in what Paul sees as just some certain important theological issues that help to define their faith, their relationship with God, and the inherently problematic relationship between Jews and Gentiles who together form the believing community. But who better to do the seemingly impossible task than Paul? He could speak, read, and write Greek and Hebrew. He was a diaspora Jew. So he had much more tolerance and familiarity with Gentiles than his Holy Land Jewish countrymen. He was a stellar rabbinical student of Gamaliel, and thus he held great knowledge of the Torah and the prophets, and most importantly, of Jewish law, of Halakha. He had served on the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin, and his choleric personality allowed him to lead instinctively and to not shy away from confrontations. When we understand the totality of who Paul was as a person, that is, that is the beginning of understanding what he says and how he goes about saying it. And as I emphasized in that first lesson on Romans, Paul naturally debated and answered questions in a way that was quite typical of rabbis. And it's quite familiar in the Jewish Talmud. But if a Gentile Christian commentator has no understanding of this protocol, and none I'm aware of do, then what Paul says can be and regularly is misconstrued. So, with this background now on Paul and the backdrop of his era and of his circumstances, let's open our New Testaments to Romans chapter 1 and get started. 
Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we are on page 1402. Romans chapter 1. From Shaul, a slave of the Messiah Yeshua, an emissary, because I was called and set apart for the good news of God. God promised this good news in advance through his prophets in the Tanakh. It concerns his son. He is descended from David physically. He was powerfully demonstrated to be son of God spiritually, set apart by, having, by his having been resurrected from the dead. He is Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. And through him we received grace and were given the work of being an emissary on his behalf, promoting trust, grounded obedience among all the Gentiles, including you who have been called by Yeshua, the Messiah. Two, all those in Rome whom God loves, who have been called, who have been set apart for him. Grace to you and shalom from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. First, I thank my God through Yeshua the Messiah for all of you, because the report of your trust is spreading throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit by spreading the good news about his Son, is my witness that I regularly remember you in my prayers. And I always pray that somehow now or in the future I might by God's will succeed in coming to visit you. For I long to see you so that I might share with you some spiritual gift that can make you stronger or to put it another way, so that by my, by my being with you, we might, through the faith we share, encourage one another. Brothers, I want you to know that although I have been prevented from visiting you until now, I have often planned to do so in order that I might have some fruit among you, just as I have among the other Gentiles. I owe a debt to both civilized Greeks and uncivilized people, to both the educated and the ignorant, Therefore, I am eager to proclaim the good news also to you who live in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the good news, since it is God's powerful means of bringing salvation to everyone who keeps on trusting, to the Jew especially, but equally to the Gentile. For it, in it, it is revealed how God makes people righteous in His sight. And from beginning to end, it is through trust. As the Tanakh puts it, but the person who is righteous will live his life by trust. Now, what is revealed is God's anger from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who in their wickedness keep suppressing the truth. Because what is known about God is plain to them since God has made it plain to them. For ever since the creation of the universe... His invisible qualities, both His eternal power and His divine nature, have been clearly seen because they can be understood from what He's made. Therefore, they have no excuse because although they know who God is, they do not glorify Him as God or thank Him. On the contrary, they have become futile in their thinking and their undiscerning hearts have become darkened. Claiming to be wise, they've become fools. In fact... They have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for mere images like a mortal human being or like birds or animals or reptiles. This is why God has given them up to the vileness of their heart's lusts, to the shameful misuse of each other's bodies. They have exchanged the truth of God for falsehood by worshiping and serving created things rather than the Creator. Praised be he forever. Amen. This is why God has given them up to their degrading passions, so that their women exchange their natural sexual relations for unnatural. And likewise, the men, giving up natural relations with the opposite sex, burn with passion for one another. Men committing shameful acts with other men and receiving in their own persons the penalty appropriate to their perversions. In other words, since they have not considered God worth knowing, God has given them up to their worthless ways of thinking so that they do improper things. 
They are filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and vice, stuffed with jealousy, murder, quarreling, dishonesty, and ill will. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God. They're insolent, arrogant, boastful. They plan evil schemes. They disobey their parents. They are brainless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know well enough God's righteous decree that the people who do such, do such things deserve to die. Yet not only do they keep doing them, but they applaud others who do the same. Wow, does any of that sound familiar? That could have been written yesterday. The opening words, which is, look at your Bibles, don't put them away just yet, are from Paul. I know our complete Jewish Bible says Shaul. That's not correct. In Greek, which is what this was penned in, his name is Paulos or Paulus. All throughout the book of Romans, he calls himself Paulus. We change that, by the way, to Paul in English. But never is his Hebrew name Shaul or Saul used. But it's the next few words where it gets really interesting. We're going to go slow for a while because we need to define some terms to not only understand what's happening here, but also to set the tone for this entire letter. Now, I hope this will also enable me to make a rather significant point about interpreting the book of Romans and why in our introduction I characterized what we would be doing in our study as cross-examining this work of Paul. Paul begins by calling himself a slave of the Messiah Yeshua. Now, some English versions have changed the term slave to bondservant. Bondservant is a mistranslation. It is often the preferred term, however, because of the modern-day Western Gentile world's aberrance to the institution of slavery. But it must be stated that the word chosen in Greek, doulos, slave, was also a hot-button word, a highly derogatory term in ancient Roman society. See, being a slave in the Hellenistic world of the Roman Empire was a most shameful thing. And for Paul to call himself a slave immediately lowered his status in the eyes of Gentiles, even though he says he was a slave to his God. Now, obviously, Paul's intent is not to lower his status because his immediate goal is to establish his authority. So this means we have to cross-examine this term in the Hebrew cultural context to get the correct sense of it. So right out of the gate, we see the Jewish Paul explaining and communicating in Jewish thought pattern, but he's confined to having to use the Greek language to do it since his letter recipients were Greek speakers. Paul is thinking in Hebrew societal and theological terms, but he's having to use the best available Greek words to translate. And as any translator will tell you, this can be a difficult task because there aren't always precise parallel words between languages and cultures. So often the meaning gets a little bit skewed. In Hebrew, so, uh, Hebrew society, a slave was a title or a status that was actually honorable and admirable when that person was described as being a slave of Jehovah God. The Hebrew word for slave is eved. It means both servant or slave because they were essentially seen as the same thing. Moses 
was called a slave of Jehovah in Joshua 14.7. The prophet Elijah was called a slave of Jehovah in 2 Kings 10.10. King David was regularly called a slave of God. This was, in Hebrew thought, in Hebrew culture, high praise. There are many more examples of this in Scripture. Westerners, however, spontaneously recoil from that term slave, a little bit less so from servant, because of our historical moral tug-of-war with the institution of slavery, which more often than not amounted to the enslavement and mistreatment of another and different race of people from us that for our convenience and conscience, we simply declared as inferior. Servants, however, were seen as an honorable, as a valuable institution of the lower classes serving the upper classes in European air, uh, aristocracy. So the older the English Bible version, the more we'll see the word Servant inserted, where the word really ought to be slave. The point is that while it appears to the Gentile Christian mind that Paul is deeply humbling himself by using what for us is the denigrating designation slave, denigrating at least to a Westerner, in reality, in biblical Hebrew society, being a slave of God was a special position of honor that he was ascribing to himself. You with me? It would be somewhat like saying, I am a priest of God. That is why Paul then immediately follows up the slave of Yeshua label, an especially honorable title, by adding the equally honorable but different title that he is also an emissary, an apostle, because God has set him apart for a special purpose. See how that all works together? Let me be clear. To the average Gentile Bible reader, the first verse of Romans 1 looks to be Paul humbling himself. He's not. He's actually claiming that he holds a high position of great authority due to his special association with God. Now, let me also point out that surely Paul expected his letter to be received by a Jewish believer in Rome who would have read and explained it to the Gentile believers. Otherwise, think about this. If a Gentile believer had received it and read it by himself, Paul would have been seen as a major turnoff to the Roman Gentile believers because he characterized himself as a slave. Yet as we move forward in our study, we're going to see that he obviously sought to impress the believer's community of Rome with his letter such that they would accept his authority and his spiritual leadership. Now let's talk about what the term apostle actually means. Apostle now, first of all, is an English word. In Greek, the word is apostolos. And interestingly, in the Roman world of Paul's day, apostolos applied to sending out merchant ships, and military expeditions. So they borrowed the term. So once again, it's critical that we understand this Greek term in its Hebrew sense as opposed to its Roman sense. Apostolos is an attempt to translate the concept behind the Hebrew term shaliach. Shaliach. He's trying to translate shaliach Okay, now, this concept of what a shaliach is into Greek. Although shaliach and apostolos aren't precisely synonyms. Again, just a typical translation problem. Shaliach 
in Hebrew carries this concept of agency in it. That is, an agent is a third party who is empowered to perform business on behalf of the person sending him. So the agent is given the power of his employer who sends him in his stead. The agent is thus to be viewed by those he is dealing with as the equal to his employer in whatever narrow or wide area of authority he's been given. So an apostle in the Hebrew Jewish world carried as much authority as the one who sent him. He wasn't merely a glorified messenger. That is why Christ would say to some of his original 12 apostles, 12 shaliach, actually, in John 14, 12, and 13, Yes, indeed, I tell you that whoever trusts in me will also do the same works I do. Indeed, he will do greater ones, because I'm going to the Father. In fact, whatever you ask for in my name, I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See, before Yeshua leaves and departs this earth, he empowers his original 12 as his agents on earth. His agents, his shaliach on earth. And as agents, they carry their master's power and authority just as Yeshua made it clear to them. That's the case. Paul is Yeshua's agent to the Gentiles. So, he carries Yeshua's full power and authority on earth. Paul clearly understands this. And the Jewish readers of his letter would understand this as well because they would understand his lofty position but only within a Jewish cultural context, not a Roman one. But Paul's Gentile readers in, this, in the Roman cultural context would not think of his position as, his position as all that lofty. They would see him more as a regular apostolos, a glorified messenger who was sent by his master, who merely carries out his master's orders, but he has not been given the degree of autonomous authority that an agent receives. Paul is an agent of Yeshua, not merely a messenger of Yeshua. Big distinction. I hope you are already starting to get what I'm aiming to show you. In the book of Romans, the culturally Jewish Paul is going to converse in rabbinical Hebrew thought patterns throughout the whole book. Yes, his thoughts will largely have to do with Gentiles. And yes, if a Roman Gentile unversed in Jewish culture read this letter on his own, tried to carry it out as he understood it from his Roman cultural viewpoint, it would be quite different from how Paul intended it. This is what has happened within the Christian church in general when it comes to reading and understanding Paul's letters over the centuries. It's why the Bible commentator, James D.G. Dunn, felt compelled to say with full honesty that if Christians insist on continuing to perceive Paul and interpret Paul in any other than in his true, real, rabbinical Jewish self, it, and I quote, condemns the interpretation of Paul to confusion and contradiction. So already, we've turned the first verse of Romans upside down from its traditional Christian understanding, all by recognizing Paul's Jewishness. Paul is not humbling himself. He is actually making the case for his readers to accept 
His God-given authority. This is because Paul sees himself, follow along with me, he sees himself as the 13th apostle. The terms apostle and disciple are not the same thing. They are not synonyms. A disciple is a follower. Any follower. An apostle, as we've seen, is an agent for the master. The first 12 disciples of Christ were also considered apostles. Why 12 original apostles? One for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So why did Yeshua add a 13th apostle some years later in the person of Paul? Because in actuality, there weren't 12 tribes of Israel. There were 13. When we look at the list of 12 tribes, Levi is not included. Levi is not counted among the other tribes because of their special position as Jehovah's priests. But at the same time, indeed, they are a tribe produced by Jacob, and they are a tribe of Israel from that sense. It is interesting to me that the 13th tribe of Israel is counted as priests. And Paul, as the 13th apostle, makes this connection that believers are to be counted as priests. Not physical priests that add or replace the Levite priests, but rather priests in a spiritual sense. As Rabbi Baruch likes to point out, Numbers in the Bible matter. Next, our thoroughly Jewish Paul says that the origination of the gospel, the good news of Messiah Yeshua that he's bringing to the Gentiles is taken from the holy writings, the Hebrew scriptures, specifically from the prophets. I want to remind you that as of this time, the book of Romans, we are 150 years away from having a Christian New Testament ordained into existence. So whatever talk we hear from Paul about scriptures and about holy writings, well, it refers to the only holy writings that existed in Paul's day, what we call the Old Testament. Some of the gospel accounts about Christ and some of Paul's letters would indeed start to circulate among believing congregations, even by the the time he wrote the book of Romans. But to call them Holy Writ or the New Testament is reading something back into the Bible that wouldn't even exist until well over a century later. To be clear, Paul says that the gospel is an Old Testament concept. But the point that he's making to the Gentiles is, follow this, it is a Hebrew religious concept taken from a Hebrew holy book. In verse 3, Paul explains that this good news, evangelion in Greek, is directly about and tied to God's Son. Now, the term God's Son or Son of God was used in Hebrew culture in a, in a number of different settings. Sometimes it referred to Israel as a whole. Other times to the kings of Israel. Sometimes even to angels. Thus, it would take some additional definition by Paul to better explain who this Son of God is that he's speaking about and what exactly that, that, that means. So the next attribute of who the good news is about is that he is descended from King David, physically. So this person is spiritually tied to God and physically tied to King David. Now, these two attributes are essential to the expected Messiah of Israel. But what positively identified this person, who is the subject of the good news, as Yeshua of Nazareth, is he was resurrected from the dead. Then Paul adds yet another attribute to this person who is at the center of the good news, the gospel. This person, the Messiah, 
is also Lord. See, it's one thing to be the Messiah who liberates Israel from their oppressors. It's quite another to be Israel's Lord because it adds the attribute of divinity to the Messiah. Who, who would understand any of this? Who would understand it? Gentiles? Even if they're believers? Heavens, no! Only Jews would understand even the thrust of Paul's assertion, whether they agreed with it or not. Because a Messiah and his nature are uniquely Hebrew concepts. They didn't exist out in the Gentile world. Verse 5 has Paul explaining that Yeshua is the mediator of this good news. Thus, it is from Yeshua that grace and authority have been given to Paul of being the apostle, or better, as we've learned, shaliach, agent, to the Gentiles. Then in verse 6, Paul extends that authority to include the Gentiles of Rome. Now let's be clear what's happening here. I said in the first part of my message today that Paul finds himself in this awkward position vis-a-vis -vis the congregation of Rome. See, Paul did not establish any of the believing congregations in Rome. He didn't handpick and install the elders, nor did he establish the doctrines that they've been observing. In fact, he's never even been to Italy, let alone to Rome. But his goal is to convince these believers of Rome to accept him as their ultimate earthly religious authority, and especially the Gentiles. But clearly the Jewish believers too. Now watch, watch with me Paul's impeccable logic at work, how he walks us through this. He says this, point number one, it was Yeshua that appointed Paul as the 13th apostle. So, point number two, this 13th apostle was to act as Yeshua's agent to the Gentiles. Point number three, it was the same Yeshua who called or elected the Gentile believers of Rome to the faith. So, point four, because points one, two, and three are all true, then it follows that the Gentile believers of Rome must be subject to Paul's apostleship. Chinese fingers, trapped. Paul is playing hardball. Yet, everything he says is true. He's right. But around four years later, from when he wrote this letter, when he finally does get to Rome, it's as a prisoner. And when he finally meets the leadership of the Roman Jewish community, we read this exchange in Acts chapter 29, uh, 28, rather. Acts 28, verses 20 and 22. 20 through 22. This is why I, Paul, have asked to see you and speak with you, for it's because of the hope of Israel that I have this chain around me. And they said to him, We've not received any letters about you from Yehuda, from Judah. None, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we do think it would be appropriate to hear your views from you yourself, for all we know about this sect is that people everywhere speak against it. Now, while it's my speculation, it would seem that Paul's effort to be accepted as the long-distance authority over the believers at Rome didn't take hold. Remember, four years have passed. Didn't take hold. Although the implication from the book of Acts is that these Jews Paul met were probably not believers when he was a prisoner, it is not possible that they had no dealings at all with the believing community of Jews and Gentiles in the same city. 
I mean, what we also see in this excerpt from Acts 28 is that the Jews of Rome, of course, looked to Judea, meaning Jerusalem, really, as, their, as the place of their religious authority. As they tell Paul, they've heard nothing bad about him from where? From Judea, from Jerusalem. So since he is here, well, they want to hear directly from him. There is no hint that these Jews knew anything about any letter Paul had sent to the Romans four years earlier. It's like it never happened. But interestingly, what we find as the book of Acts had come to a close is that some of these Jews who came to meet with Paul believed him. And so they accepted Yeshua as their Messiah. And so Paul has now accomplished something of great importance to him and to the Lord. He has finally established a community of believers in Rome with him as their unquestionable head. Well, what of the community of believers that Paul addressed in his letters, in his letter rather, to the Romans four years earlier? We don't know. There is no mention of them in Acts 28 and no mention of them in any other New Testament book. But clearly Paul teaching and leading this particular new believers community that he personally established, even though he was a prisoner, must have survived and thrived as did all the other ones he had personally established in Corinth and Thessalonica and Ephesus and so on. This is because within just a couple of more years, the unstable Nero will begin a vicious campaign of persecution against believers in Rome in order to try to draw attention away from himself as the one who started a fire that burnt a huge portion of Rome to the ground. Instead, he blamed it on the believers. Well, now that we've concluded the preamble to the letter of the Romans, next time we'll move into verse 7 and actually get to the body of the letter.